Lord, we uh, come to you again. Lord, we want to express our love for you as we look into your word. And Lord, we don't take it for granted. We know we are very blessed here at this church, here in this country at this time to be able to open the scriptures and freely search you out in them. And so, Lord, we want you to come now and fill our hearts, speak to our hearts, minister to our deepest needs. Lord, you know every man in this room. You know what we struggle with. You know what we're going through. You see everything. You know everything. So we call upon you, Lord, that you would give us the grace to move the mountains. Lord, we know that the enemy will come in like a flood. We know the devil hates us, wants to kill us. But Lord, we also know that no weapon formed against us can prosper. And so, Lord, as we gather in your name, we ask more than anything that tonight every man would be able to set aside any distractions and enter in to your presence. God, that we could focus, that we can tune in, and that we can hear your voice when you speak. And Lord, I pray as the speaker that you would speak, that you would just use this vessel to speak your truth. Nothing more, nothing less. So Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence, and we say to you as men that we love you, Lord. And we need you. And we ask you to come now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're still in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 is a a rough chapter. It's rough. It It can wear you down. It can even burn you out if you focus on it for too long. But here it is. We have it in our canon of scripture. And God wants us to have it wants us to study it, wants us to understand it. Now, as we go through these type of judgments, these spiritual judgments, understand we may not understand every little detail of it. So we go through it and we try to break it down and we, dr- we try to draw out of it what God wants us to have. Now, remember, this wasn't given to the tribulation saints necessarily. These Scriptures that we're studying were written to the church. So God gave the revelation, all of it, to the church. So when we get to these hard passages, we don't just blaze through it, skip over it. We treat it just like every other passage in the Bible. And we want it to uh, speak to us. And we want God to show us uh, what is important in it for each one of us. So that's how we kind of approach this. Now, last week we talked about hell on earth. We literally saw demons from the pit of hell. Angels that were bound and reserved for the day of judgment because they did not keep their proper domain. But they came out of their domain and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And these angels were fallen angels that were imprisoned by God for the day of judgment. So we looked at that last week and we see that they have a leader, the angel over the bottomless pit, whose name means destroyer. We also looked at a fallen star and we said that fallen star is a person and that person is the person of Lucifer who became Satan. Now, Lucifer was given authority, given keys to go down and open the bottomless pit. So we spent a little bit of time talking about the bottomless pit. And we understand that the bottomless pit is not some science fiction type of place. It's a real place, and there are real people in the bottomless pit as well as fallen angels in different locations of the bottomless pit. We know the bottomless pit is also called Sheol in the Old Testament. It's referred to as hell. It's referred to as the temporary place of torment. 
in Luke 16. So we looked at a lot of that last week, and now we come to another woe. These are the woe trumpet judgments. And I think the reason they are called woe judgments is because now we are in the middle of the tribulation. I believe last week's study in the first part of chapter 9, the first woe judgment happens just prior to the middle of the tribulation. And that's why those locust-like demons that came out of the pit were not allowed to torment those who had the seal of God. But now as we look at this new woe judgment, the sixth woe judgment, the sixth trumpet, the, third, the second woe judgment, but the sixth trumpet judgment, which can be a little confusing, but it's really not. We have seven trumpet judgments. We have four of them that are not woes and three of them that are woes. And we already looked at one woe judgment, which was the fifth trumpet judgment. And now we're looking at the second woe judgment, which is the sixth trumpet judgment. So we're chronologically moving through the tribulation and following along with these judgments and we're looking at the information that we're being given and we're analyzing it because we don't have any specific time frame of where we are from the scriptures. So we have to look at what we're being told and plug it into the totality of scripture and understand exactly where we are in the tribulation. And I see a big difference in this next woe judgment, the sixth trumpet judgment, the second woe, because there's nothing said about the attack that's going to take place in this judgment about protection for those who are sealed. So either they're still on earth and they're not protected during this, or they've been removed from the earth. And when we get to chapter 14, you will see in the middle of the tribulation, the 144,000 Jews will be redeemed from the earth to stand before the throne of God. So somewhere around this time, maybe right here between these two demonic onslaught judgments, the 144,000 Jews are now removed. And once they are removed, according to Revelation 14, there will be an angel flying through the midst of heaven preaching the everlasting gospel because God is always faithful to give a witness to the world even when they're being slaughtered. And what we're going to see tonight is a slaughter. The title of this message is Death Returns to the Earth. In the last passage, in the earlier parts of this chapter, we saw that death went on vacation for five months. No one was able to die, even though they were being tormented by these locust-type demons out of the bottomless pit. They were only able to torment men for five months. And the torment was so bad that men will want to die, but death will flee from them. They will not even be able to take their own life. Death will flee from them. So there was no death from this fifth trumpet judgment, which is the first woe. But now, death returns to the earth. And this time when death comes, when this plague comes, it is going to kill a third of what's left on the earth. Remember back in the seal judgments, a fourth of the population of the earth already dies. So in the early parts of the tribulation, we've already lost a fourth, and now we're going to lose another third of humanity. Billions and billions of people are going to die. And the reason they're going to die is not because these demons are the most dangerous judgments in the Bible, even though they rate way up there. They bring some dangerous wrath and dangerous judgment. But this is not the most dangerous thing that could happen on the earth to unbelievers. 
The most dangerous thing is revealed to us here at the end of chapter 9. And at the end of chapter 9, we read that men will not repent. The most dangerous thing facing any person that lives on the earth is an unrepentant heart towards God. And in spite of everything happening, even though they know this wrath is coming from God, they realize they're in the time of God's wrath, yet they are still not repenting. And it could be that some of them, most of them, have received the mark of the beast, and a lot of these people that are slaughtered are dying because they are demon-possessed, and they are under great delusion. God said... Because they received the lie and rejected the truth, he will send strong delusion to those who are on the earth during the tribulation. And I got to tell you, if you can be on earth and go through this and see all this and not repent, you have to be delusional. And I think the big message that we get from this is God is still giving them opportunity to repent because God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want to slaughter most of the people on earth. He doesn't delight in that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But because they have hardened their hearts and they stubbed their nose at God and they turned their back on God and they worship demons and idols, God says, it's time for them to die. And they will die. And death is only the first phase of the judgment. When they die, they will find themselves not in the earthly wrath, but eventually in the eternal wrath. And the eternal wrath is exactly what it says, eternal. When you get in the prison of eternal wrath in the lake of fire, there is no parole, there's no way out, you're never going to be released, it is permanent and it is torment forever and ever and ever according to the Bible. And so for us as men that are saved, that will escape all of this, we take this information and we realize the importance of going out and warning our family and friends that this day, the day of the Lord, this wrath, this judgment, these woe judgments are coming. They are coming. And each one of us needs to understand this so that we can be ready to give every man an answer for the hope that is in us. It is my hope, it is your hope that one day, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be caught up to God and to his throne and we will escape all this stuff that's coming upon the earth because we will stand before the Son of Man. That's our blessed hope. And that's the hope that we share with the world outside. They need to know. Someone needs to tell them. Uh, The Apostle Paul said, how will they know? How will they hear the gospel? How will they hear the good news unless they have a preacher? How will they ever know unless someone tells them? And we got to stop being men that are not equipped, not informed. We need to be grounded in the word of God so that we can take it to the nations outside, right outside this building. There's a lot of people still that do not know. They do not know. And we are God's missionaries in the last hour to take the truth to them in a loving, persuasive way. Convince them that this isn't just information This is something we really, really believe. And if we really, really believe it and we really love them, we will tell them. We have to tell them. So I encourage all you guys to do just that. Look at verse 12. 
chapter 9, verse 12. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Notice what it says there at the end of verse 12. Two more woes are coming when? After these things. That's important because some people try to blend these two demon, demonic judgments together. But it's clear that this is a whole separate judgment. One woe is past. One woe is done. One woe is behind us. Still two more woes are coming. When are they coming? After these things. After the things we just looked at in the previous woe. So you can follow this like a chronological order. After what we just learned about the demons, the locusts coming out the bottomless pit, now we're seeing another woe. Separate from the first one. So this is not the same demons from the previous judgment that are operating again in this second judgment. This is a whole different judgment, a whole different set of demonic forces coming from a whole different place doing a whole different thing. So if anybody tries to combine this and make this all part of the same judgment, you got some problems. Because there's definitely big differences. Then the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Pay close attention to what John says. I saw the horses in the vision. And those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, highest in blue, sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murderers or their sorceries or their sexual morality or their thefts. So this is what's going on here at the end of this second woe judgment. There are men that will survive this onslaught of demonic forces. No matter if you believe that this is some military human demonic army or you believe this is straight from another location such as the pit of hell There will be people that will survive and a third of the earth will die. That's clear as we read this. So let's break this down. Let's go back to verse 13. And I want you guys to really look at this in your Bible. So the sixth angel sounded... And when he sounded, John says, I heard a voice. I heard a voice. 
Now, if you've been with us from the beginning of the Revelation study, this is nothing new. I see John as this first century man just standing in this futuristic scene and he's trying to follow what he sees and he's trying to write it down and he's trying to describe it to us in first century language. So if John says, I saw the horses, John would know what a horse is. So he saw literal horses. Not normal horses, but horses. And John says, I heard a voice. And I really want to talk to you guys about hearing voices. It is so vitally important that we understand how to recognize the voice of God. Did you know God is speaking all the time? If you can't hear God when he speaks, it's because you are not listening or you haven't trained yourself to hear the word of God when it comes to you. I've had times in my own life when I can read through a passage and put the Bible down and wonder, what did I just read? Because I didn't understand of looking at it in detail. It's not just reading it, it's studying it. Study to show ourselves approved. So it becomes vitally important because you got this man, and I don't know if you guys have seen any of these videos on social media that's going around. Somebody sent me one of these videos and I, I, I laughed for probably 20 minutes. Where does this construction guy, one of my construction friends said, there's a construction guy and he's standing there and he's on a job site for the first time and he's looking around. And, and he's watching a guy like open a fire hydrant and trying to get a drink from a fire hydrant and the thing surges in pressure and blows his teeth out, almost blows his head off. <laughs> and he backs up and, and the guy's like looking and he's, oh, And then there's another guy that's pouring concrete and he's got it all done, all finished, perfectly finished. And he lays his his rake behind him and, and he's looking at how great of a job he did. And he turns around, steps on the rake, it pops up, smacks him in the head. He falls backwards onto the concrete. (laughs) You talk about funny. But then there's the guy that's standing there like it's his first day on the job and he's like, I don't think I want to do this. <laughs> I could visualize John that way. And, and John here says, I heard a voice. This ain't the first time John heard a voice. Go with me to Revelation chapter 1, back to chapter 1. I do want to spend a few minutes on this because I think we can get some good application from it. Look at verse 10. Because it's not always God speaking. So you have to look at the details if you want to know who's speaking and what they're talking about. Look at verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, notice he heard a loud voice. I heard a voice, a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man. So John was in tune with this voice. And he hears a voice behind him. He recognizes the voice. He turns to see who's speaking to him. Right? Now, who was it that was speaking to John in Revelation 1? It was Jesus. Right? Now, we can assume as we go through this, every time there's a voice or a loud voice that it's Jesus, but that is not the case. 
So you have to look at details and you have to pay attention when you're studying the scripture. If you want to hear God's voice, you have to know how to recognize God's voice by looking at the details of what the word of God says. And this loud voice thing is given to us over and over and over in the scriptures. Now in chapter 9, he doesn't hear a loud voice, he just hears a voice. But look with me over at Revelation 4 to get more understanding of this. Look at verse 1 of Revelation 4. After these things, after the church age, John says, Behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place. Now, who do you think that is speaking to John to come up here through the door into heaven? Who's speaking to him? It's a voice like a trumpet. Well, you let the Bible interpret the Bible and you guys are absolutely right. It is Jesus again. How do we know? Because you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and it says the Lord himself, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God when the church gets caught up. So here in chapter 4, John hears a voice and he goes up. He's listening for what the Lord wants to say to him so he can make the move in obedience to God. And he's caught up into the throne room of God. Now look look down at verse 5 of chapter 4. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So now... John is in heaven and he's before the throne and he's saying this is what's coming from the throne, voices. Now whose voice is this? It's it's voices, like many voices. Is this Jesus? Is this the angels? Well, guess what? We just don't know. This is a voice that is unknown because we don't have detail to tell us what these voices are, but we can conclude that it might be the 24 elders, the four living creatures, all the angels around the throne, and so their praise is going up, and and John hears voices and lightnings and thunders, and he's in heaven, and he hears voices. So we look at the details to know of This is God's voice or an angel's voice or many voices coming before uh, the throne, coming directly to John. So you see that in verse 5 there of chapter 4, it's not Jesus, but it's unknown voices. You guys ever hear voices and you don't know whose voice it is? Look at the details. What other voices saying. There's a lot of people that will come to you and say, hey, God spoke to me. You ever heard someone do, do that? God spoke to me and God wants me to tell you what he spoke to me because this is for you. Voices. If God wants to speak to you, he doesn't need someone's special revelation of God to tell you what God wants you to do. He may do that, but that's very uncommon. God will usually speak to us through his word. And if we're listening and paying attention, you will hear his voice because you know his voice. So John doesn't really tell us who these voices are, but look at Revelation 5.2. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals. 
So who's the loud voice that's speaking? Now, God's voice is the one that's described as the loud voice. But here we see a strong angel that also has a loud voice. So you look at the details and you realize when God's speaking, when an angel's speaking, when a multitude's speaking, and this becomes important as you study the book of Revelation. You have to look at the details. You have to flip back and forth to get a proper understanding of what's going on. Is this making sense? And then you go down to verse 11 of chapter 5. In verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. So now you see another loud voice, but it's not a single voice. And the passage tells you that these are all the angels, the elders. This is the whole host of heaven before the throne of God saying, worthy is the lamb. So now I'm getting, I'm looking at all this. I'm looking at the the clues we have from this voice and that voice and these voices. And when I put all this together, man, the whole thing starts to make sense. Because I'm not only hearing what these voices are saying, but I'm also seeing what they're doing. And when I see what they say and understand what they do, and I put it in its proper place according to the passage and let the Bible interpret the Bible, then the book of Revelation becomes a very simple book to understand. Is that making sense? Yeah. One more place there in Revelation 7, 2. After these things, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or in any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice. So there's another angel. Are you following why I'm sharing this with you? Because when you go back to Revelation, go back to Revelation 9, Revelation 9, verse 13, and you are reading it and you're just looking at it and I heard a voice. It would be so easy for you to just bypass that one little word, a voice without really digging in to the details and how voices are used differently in the book of Revelation by different beings. But when you understand that, this is important for the study of scriptures. This is how we devour it, we break it down, we look it up, and you say, well, it's not that big a deal. It's a voice, Ken. We don't know whose voice this is. This is an unknown voice here in verse 13. Why is that important? It's important for understanding the whole book of the Revelation. And it's not just we're picking one thing. There's lots of things like this. And when you start to dial into the detail of every little word in the book of Revelation, you're going to find out how many times it's used and how relevant it is. Does that make sense? This is how we are to be studying our Bible. There's one more place, and this is the final place of the loud voice. Chapter 11, verse 15. I mean, there may be other mentions of the loud voice, but this is, this is what it's all about. When the seventh angel sounded, there were loud voices in heaven. 
saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So how important it is to understand what's going on? There's going to be announcement, an announcement from voices in heaven, probably the angels, we don't know for sure because we're not told in this section. So we don't get side railed by trying to figure out something that's not You're not able to figure it out. So we can speculate and say this is probably the angels announcing the takeover of God when the seventh trumpet is sounded. There were loud voices in heaven making this announcement that the kingdoms of this world are now going to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And this would be a good time for every man to say hallelujah. Amen. Let it come. Lord Jesus, bring it. Take it back. It belongs to you. Lord, you defeated all of them on the cross, and you're going to take it back. It's exciting. (laughs) I can't wait. I'll be looking for you, Manny. So, back to verse 13. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Now, what's the four horns on the golden altar? Don't worry, I'm not going to spend another half hour on the golden, the horns on the golden altar. But we could. Do you know you can do a whole study on the horns on the golden altar? You can go back to the Old Testament and you can search the scriptures and you can compare it to what's being said over and over again here in the book of Revelation. Now, this is the first time the four horns are missing or are mentioned, but not the first time the golden altar is mentioned, right? So what are the four horns? Horns in the Bible are symbolic of powers, powers. You go to Daniel chapter 7, and there's a beast with seven heads and ten horns. The horns symbolize powers, powerful nations. And then there's another horn, a little horn that comes out of the ten horns, and so you have this symbolic language, and it's consistent in the Bible. So if you want to get a good understanding of what your Bible's talking about when it mentions horns... You have to go back and study the scripture to see the meaning of horns. So the horns represent powers. Why are there four horns on the golden altar? They were instructed to build the golden altar that way, and they did it exactly as God instructed them. We don't know the exact meaning of the four horns, but you might conclude from what we've already studied and and looked at in detail are these four cherubim angels called the four living creatures that have eyes in front, eyes in back. They never take their eyes off of God. And maybe, just maybe, these four horns represent the four cherubim that never take their eyes off of God. Four powerful, high-level angels designed to spend every minute of every day looking at God, watching God, worshiping God, leading worship in heaven. Now, what is the golden altar? We don't really need to guess at all to that because we've already looked at it in detail. The golden altar is before the veil. There's the, there's the holy place, and then there's the holy of holies, and the two places are separated by a veil. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, and the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom, right? Symbolizing we now have access to God. Well, the priests in the Old Testament did not have access to God, but once a year, they would go in behind the veil and they would burn incense before God on behalf of the people, but the high priest alone and only once a year. But outside the Holy of Holies, you have the golden altar. 
And on one side of the golden altar, you have the seven lampstands. And on the other side, you have the showbread. And you can look for yourself in Deuteronomy what the furnishings of the tabernacle were. But everything in the tabernacle was a picture of what's in heaven. It was a type. So there in heaven, there's the golden altar. And on the golden altar are burning coals. And those burning coals are there in in the presence of the holy place because this is where they would come in, the priests, every morning and every evening, they can come to the golden altar and present their incense on the golden altar in prayers to the people. And they would come in and they would take some of the blood off the brazing altar that was in the outer courts where the animals were sacrificed and they would bring in some of the blood and sprinkle it on the coals to make atonement. But they really couldn't have atonement except once a year. So they were really coming in to this golden altar as an act of worship, as an act of mercy, offering these incense, offering the prayers of the people before God. And when they come in and they offer the prayers on the golden altar, God responds in chapter 8 by telling the angel to take some of the coals off the golden altar, put it in a vial, and throw it down to the earth. And that's what starts the trumpet judgments in chapter 8. So we're already aware of the golden altar. The golden altar is a place where the prayers of the saints are being burned before God and the smell and the aroma of the sweetness of the incense and the prayers of the saints are going up to God and God is now responding to the prayers of the saints. So if you pray and you think God doesn't hear you, you're wrong. God hears and God knows and he's going to act in his timing. So keep praying. Never stop praying. And make sure you're praying, Lord, not my will be done, but your will, your kingdom come. Lord, we want your kingdom to come. We've had enough of this earthly kingdom and we're praying, Lord, that your kingdom come on earth. And when those prayers are offered up to God, God's going to send the final message through an angel or through angels saying the time has come, the seventh trumpet will be sounded and that will be it. The announcement will be made that God is taking over the kingdoms of the world and giving it to his Christ, his son. Powerful stuff. So we know what the horns are. We know what the golden altar is. And we see the location of the golden altar. The golden altar is before the throne of God. Now, notice what it says there in verse 14. It's a continuation of chapter 13. The voice is saying, speaking to the sixth angel who had the trumpet. And the command is going through the voice, whoever it is. Maybe it's God, maybe it's Christ, maybe it's an angel. But it's going through the voice and the voice is telling the sixth angel to release the four angels who are bound So now we run into four angels that are bound. Now you know, no holy angel of God needs to be bound. The holy angels of God are free to operate in the power and the purpose of God. And they do exactly that because they are holy angels. But fallen angels do not obey God and do not follow the purpose of God. So there are angels that need, that needed to be bound. 
We already saw that there were angels bound, locked up in the bottomless pit. And we also talked about Satan himself at the second coming of Christ will be gathered up, rounded up, and thrown into the bottomless pit and chained up there for a thousand years. So we understand that angels are sometimes bound. Here we have four powerful fallen angels that are bound. And you might say, well, what did they do, Ken? You guys want to know what they did? I don't know. <laughs> I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked for detail, but there's no detail to tell us why they are bound. It's possible that they did the same thing that the angels that were in the bottomless pit did and left their proper domain and went into strange flesh. It's possible that they were part of that whole thing with the Nephilim. When, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and tried to contaminate the human race, not only to possibly taint the whole human race so that no human can ever be saved because angels can't be redeemed, but what they really wanted to do was contaminate the bloodline of the Messiah. Both of those are true. So we don't know. We don't know what these four angels did, but we do know that they are bound, and these are four of Satan's bad boys. They're bad. And it seems from the passage that they have some kind of control over legions and legions and legions of demons and we see the number of those that they control is 200 million. Did I read that right? Imagine these four angels that are bound. They're bound because they have control over 200 million other fallen angels, demons, and they're going to be released. The four angels who are bound are told by the voice from the four horns on the altar and the golden altar to release the four angels who are bound. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be anywhere around when these four guys are released. Because these four seem to have no restraint from God. The ones that came out of the bottomless pit, the locust, one, the locust ones had restraint. They couldn't take anyone's life. They can only torment people for five months. But these demons are allowed to kill. And they've been prepared to kill. So just try to visualize this. There's these four angels that are bound, and we don't know who they really are, but I do have, I think, some clues who, to who they might be. Can't prove it, not 100% sure, but it's very interesting that four great beasts came up out of the sea in Daniel 7. And these four great beasts became four great empires on the earth. And if you read through the book of Daniel, you'll see every, every time there was a king like Nebuchadnezzar or Alexander the Great, there were always demonic demons influencing, maybe even possessing these kings. So when Babylon was there, the Medo-Persian Empire was there, the Grecian Empire was there, and finally the Roman Empire, four of them, there were demons, demonic beings, maybe these angels, the four of them, were the real power behind these kingdoms. You know that every political leader has demonic powers behind them. All of them do. Every earthly kingdom, every empire, every er earthly government has 
either influenced from demonic forces or some of the leaders are demon-possessed. You don't have to look far to see a demon-possessed leader, right? right. There's one in, well, (laughs) yes, I don't have to say it, right? It's real. It's real. And when you read Daniel chapter 10, you will see how real what I'm saying to you is because Daniel's in this spiritual battle over the Jewish people and he's praying and his prayers are being hindered by demons for 21 days and he can't really fight off this demon. So they have to call in Michael, the great prince, who comes to the rescue of Daniel, and he comes to the rescue by subduing these principalities of Persia and Greece. So when the leaders of these empires actually die, and their kingdom comes to an end, where did they go? Bound at the great river Euphrates. Good possibility. If you disagree with that, good, I don't care. (laughs) You might be right. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think it's interesting. Now, when it comes to four angels, remember, we already saw the four cherubim, the four living creatures, and then we also saw another group of four, not the four living creatures, but another group of four in chapter 7 going out to hold back the four winds from blowing on the earth. So this is the third group of four that we encounter here in the book of Revelation. And the only difference in these four is they are fallen angels that are bound. But not for long. They are released here in the middle of the tribulation. Are you getting the idea why Jesus said in the middle of the tribulation, when you see the Antichrist go on to the Temple Mount, go into the temple and desecrate the temple, get out of Jerusalem, get out of the city, there's going to be such a time of trouble as the world has never seen before, nor shall it ever see again. You talk about trouble. Because when the Antichrist goes on to the Temple Mount, tells the world that he's God, He is demonic. He is the devil incarnate. Remember, around this same time, the devil's been cast down to the earth and he comes down to the earth in Revelation 12 knowing that he has a short time left on earth. And he comes down with great, great wrath. It's going to be a satanic slaughter around the middle of the tribulation period. So we see the release of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, we're not told who the four angels are, but we are told the location of where they are bound. You see that there? They are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, I don't know if you guys know a lot about the great river Euphrates, but the great river Euphrates is mentioned over and over and over and over again in the Bible. One of the things we know about the great river Euphrates, is it was one of the four rivers that flowed out of Eden, the Garden of God. Satan was in the Garden of God. Satan would have been familiar with this river, the Euphrates. Satan himself may have even hung out at the river Euphrates. You know Satan and demons hang out at rivers. Did you guys know that? I know it. I used to go to a river all the time. Colorado River. And if you think demons don't hang out at the river, maybe you need to take a trip to the Colorado River just to confirm that demons like the river. 
They like to influence people at the river, take their clothes off and do vile things right out in public. So I'm not encouraging you to go <laughs> to the Colorado River. When we used to go, we made sure it was a Monday through a Thursday. And it was pretty safe during that time. But if you go during a holiday down to a place like Lake Havasu or Parker on the river, you're going to see demonic activity. So it's possible back in the Garden of Eden that we have this fallen angel hanging out around the Euphrates River before the Garden of Eden was destroyed, and that's where he tempted Adam and Eve to commit the first sin. That's where the first death took place, somewhere around the Euphrates River. Did you know that the waters of the Euphrates River ran through the city of Babylon? Babylon is a, is a name in the Bible that represents evil religion. Even to the point of mystery Babylon. So you have Nebuchadnezzar's palace, his empire, and the source of water in Babylon was the Euphrates River. So if you would have one of these four angels possessing this King Nebuchadnezzar before he got saved, and I do believe he got saved, or maybe not even possessing him, maybe influencing him, it's very possible that this angel would be one of the four that were, were very familiar with the Euphrates River. Like Satan, he could have hung out at the Euphrates in the city of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Very possible. Now, there's more about the Euphrates River. doesn't end here. How many guys have read about the Tower of Babel in ancient Babylon? We all know about the Tower of Babel, right? We all know that the governments in those days were trying to form a new world order and they were all coming together to speak one language and communicate to form a new world order, a global order. God came down and destroyed the Tower of Babel. But if you were there and you were able to go up in the Tower of Babel and look down at the land of Mesopotamia, guess what you would be able to see from the elevated places of the tower? The Euphrates River. Just a little, a little ways away from the Tower of Babel. Wow. So we see here also in Revelation 9 that these angels abound at the great river Euphrates. And the river Euphrates is also a dividing line between the eastern world and the western world. So to the east you have all the nations of the east and to the west you have all the nations of the west and you have Israel in the middle as the Middle East, but still on the western side of the Euphrates River. So you can kind of see the importance of the Euphrates River. And it's, here's another thought. It's also possible, according to the scriptures, highly likely that when the children of Israel were in Babylon for 70 years, they hung out at the Euphrates River. It's possible that Daniel and the captives had access to the Euphrates River because Daniel was in the palace of the king in Babylon. So you have the Hebrew children in captivity hanging out in Babylon, maybe even at the Euphrates River. And when they left Babylon which most of them didn't because they loved it there. The question comes, did Babylon leave them? 
That's a big question in Scripture when you consider mystery Babylon. And that's for another day. It's coming soon, though. So, the original land of Israel, when God gave the land to Israel, did you know that the southern and eastern borders of the original land that was given to Israel came right up to the Euphrates River? That's how much land they had. That's how much land they've lost. Now over in Revelation chapter 8, we saw an attack on the rivers and the springs of water. There was a torch burning like fire that came down and struck the rivers and the waters and a third of the rivers and the waters became poison and men drank the poison and men died because of the waters that were made bitter. So there's people that worship the trees. You guys know about the tree huggers, the mother earth lovers. They're worshiping the creation and God says, you want to worship the creation? I'm going to destroy the trees, the grass. I'm going to destroy the natural things on the earth because you're worshiping the creation. You, you are the people that think that it's important to go green. Say, save the planet, man. And God's showing them, if you worship the creation, I'm going to take the creation away from you. So those are the ones who worship the creation. Then you have the ones that worship the demons. And God's saying to these groups, this group of people on the earth, you want to worship the demons? I'm going to send you the demons that you worship and they are going to kill you. You know, God will give you what you want. If you're persistent and unrepentant and you keep pursuing the things that God says, don't pursue those things. Stop pursuing those things. If you keep pursuing those things, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be cut off and without remedy. And then the gods that you're pursuing, where will they be when you need help? They're the gods that can't see, can't hear, can't do anything because they're not really gods. They're made of wood and stone and things made with with the hands, made with human hands. They can't come and rescue anyone. And behind every idol, guess what's behind every idol? A demon. Influencing people to worship false gods. It's unreal. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year were released to kill a third of mankind. So they were prepared. Who prepared them? Well, the passage doesn't tell us who prepared them But obviously God is involved in the preparation of these angels to bring the judgment, no matter if he uses the devil himself to prepare them. Either way, this judgment is being orchestrated from the throne of God and these angels, these demons are being released to go out and to kill a third of the population of the earth. And listen, that's a lot of people. That's carnage like you and I can't comprehend. Dead bodies everywhere. The stench alone could kill you. Dead bodies, possibly a billion. We don't know how many people, half the population of the earth is probably already gone and now we have another third of the population of the earth being destroyed by this army of what I think are demons. No matter how you look at it, this is a demonized army, no matter if you think it's men, no matter if you think it's 
some kind of creatures that are demons. Either way, their intentions are to kill and they've been prepared to kill. These are experts in warfare. And when they come, nothing's going to stop them. Nothing's going to restrain them because God has appointed the day, the hour, the month. It's going to happen exactly when God wants it to happen. God is in control. And when God pulls the plug and tells that angel to sound that trumpet, this is the day. It's the year, the hour, the month, the day. The exact time that God says it's going to happen, it will happen. Can't someone stop this terrible thing? No. Who can stop God? He's almighty God. He's all powerful God. He sits in the heavens and does whatever he pleases. And it doesn't please him to bring this judgment, but because he's not only sovereign, he's holy, and he's just, and he's righteous, and now he's dealing with the wickedness that's in the earth because God is good all the time. And he's releasing the evil on those who are not good because they deserve it. Did you know you and I deserve it? but he's not going to give us what we deserve because Jesus died in our place to pay the price for what we deserve because we are men that have repented and surrendered our lives to Christ and we as men in these last days are serious about following God because if you weren't, you wouldn't be here at a study like this. So I'm praying for every one of you guys to understand that God wants to use you. He's he's waiting for you to come and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Time is running out. The day, the hour, it's upon us. No one knows the day or hour. We don't know when time will run out, but we do know that there is an appointed time. And when the Father says... Come home, my church. We're going up, and the opportunity for the church will be over. So we do it now. We do it now. We were called for a time such as this. So they were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the number of them, so you might say, well, how did John know it was 200 million? There's no way he could have counted 200 million. Well, he says, just to keep you from arguing that point, I heard the number of them. So the voice must have announced the number of the horsemen. Now, guys like Hal Lindsey and other scholars of old will tell you that these are men on horses. This is some military type of army of 200 million soldiers that have been hiding in the Euphrates River waiting to come across. Or maybe it's the kings of the east and some people try to draw the parallel between this judgment and the judgment in Revelation chapter 16. Flip over there. You guys want me to stop right now? It's getting late. (laughs) I love you guys, man. Look at chapter 16, verse 12. Some people try to make this the same event that we're reading in chapter 9 because of the kings of the east coming across the Euphrates. But when I read through this, I think you're going to notice that there's some big differences, big differences. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frog. Notice three, not four. And I saw three unclean spirit like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. 
and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, to the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Drop down to verse 16. And they gather them together to the place in Hebrew, Armageddon. So this is a clear battle of, of nations. This is called in chapter 16, the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is going to take place in the valley of Megiddo, Megiddo, in the valley of Jezreel, just outside the Holy Land where Jerusalem is, just outside there in this huge valley that stretches for about 200 miles from the Dead Sea down to the Mediterranean Sea. All the armies of the Antichrist in the West will be gathered at that valley for the final battle. And when that happens, news from the North and news from the East trouble the kings of the West, according to Daniel chapter 11, 40 through 45. And then the kings of the East will come across the Euphrates River and it doesn't say anywhere in that battle that it's 200 million. But some people like to say only Red China can field an army of 200 million. So this must be the same event. You could take that route if you want, but I don't think so. The timing's off. What we read back in chapter 9 is happening around the middle of the tribulation. And it doesn't seem to me, and maybe I'm wrong, like it's a war of nations and kings. Because when nations go to war, they go to war against other nations. And in this chapter, chapter 9, it, it seems to be like a plague that's going after all of humanity. A third of mankind is killed. Now there are good scholars that believe that this army of horsemen, this 200 million, are the horses are not really horses, they're political or not political, but um, military, military equipment that's being hidden and somehow it's going to all come out and there's going to be 200 uh, million machines, drones, whatever, whatever you want to, choppers, helicopters, something we don't even know about and, and there'll be demons controlling these things. Maybe. But it doesn't have to be that. It could just be simple. 200 million demons on some kind of horse that's not a, a literal horse because the horse has a head like a lion and out of the lion's mouth comes fire, smoke, and brimstone. And his tail had serpent heads on his tail. So this is no ordinary horse. This is something beyond what we can maybe even comprehend that's been hidden in the great river Euphrates that's going to be released. And I think the riders that are on these horses are demons. If they're soldiers, either way, the soldiers are demon-possessed. I think we can all agree on that. Either way, this is all demonic. And people are going to be slaughtered. And I saw the horses and the vision, and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, highest and blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. So they're not literal lions' heads, but like the heads of lions. And out of their mouth came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, doesn't say by this war, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. And they were killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. And their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads. With them they do harm. So here we see these creatures or these military weapons whatever you whatever path you want to take there 
it absolutely makes no difference. What's important is they are satanic and they come to kill a third of mankind. If the fire, smoke, and brimstone is rockets and weaponry coming out of the front of one of these machines or out of the tail of one of these machines, maybe, but that's just speculation because there's nothing here to allude to that. There are writers, and we don't know. We're not, again, we don't know who the writers are, just like we don't know for sure who the four angels are because we're not told. So God doesn't want us to know the exact details of it. He just wants us to know that this is real. And in the middle of the tribulation, Satan is going to throw everything at humanity and he's going to kill a third of the population of the earth by the fire, smoke, and the brimstone. And I don't have time to go into it, but you just look up the verses revolving around the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the eternal judgment for the dead. The lake of fire is the eternal prison for Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. And when they are thrown into the lake of fire, they will be tormented by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. So these forces that we're looking at are from the pit of hell. Fire, smoke, and brimstone. Now, I don't know much about brimstone, but what I do know, it's some kind of malted, malted rock. So, it's soft rock. So you can imagine the fire coming out and some kind of molten soft rock hitting the people, sticking on, just burning them up, incinerating them. That's the picture. And this stuff's being spewed out in every direction, wherever they go, in front of them, behind them, the, the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. And I don't know how anyone escapes it, but some do. Look what it says. Verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, survivors, did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship Demons. In the middle of the tribulation, there's full on satanic worship. The beast gets his power, his throne, his authority from Satan, from the dragon. The whole government of the beast is under satanic influence, and by this time, most people have taken the mark of the beast. So it's not like they can repent because once you take the mark of the beast, you are too far gone. You can't repent. So the people that survive this may be wanting to repent, but they can't find repentance because they've taken the mark and they've worshipped the beast and his image. But there's another thing. If some of these people don't have the mark and they don't repent, it's because they went too far in their rejection of God. And their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They've gone too far. You know the story of Esau in <coughs> Hebrews 12? Esau sold his birthright for a morsel of food. And when he was done, he was sorry. And he sought repentance diligently. He wanted to repent. He sought it diligently, but he couldn't find repentance. Why? Because he sought it for the wrong reason. He sought repentance because he wanted to regain the blessing of his birthright and not because his heart was broken and contrite before God. A lot of people are in that condition today in America. They've gone so far in rejecting God that they can't repent. It's not that God won't forgive them. They've just reached the point of no return where they don't want to repent or they're searching for a false type of repentance. And because it's a false type of repentance, they can't find true saving repentance. The Bible says repent and be converted. 
If a person comes to Christ without repentance, it's probably true that they're not really saved. When I first heard the gospel, I mean, this was 40 years ago. I lived with this false idea that I was saved because when I heard the gospel, it was only part of the gospel and it left out the message of repentance. I had never heard any preaching on repentance, only that Jesus loves you, he died for you, and if you just believe it, you can be saved. Okay, I believe that. Now I'm saved. And then one day I walked into Calvary Chapel. Just a coincidence, right? Got invited there by a friend. And I walked in thinking I'm a Christian. And the first thing that rattled my cage, rattled me right in my seat. And it's hard for me to even talk about this. I had never seen 2,000 people because it was harvest. Greg Laurie's church, raising their hands, worshiping. Say, oh my gosh, I've never been in anything like this. The churches I went to back in the South, denominational stuff, had no worship like I was witnessing now. And when I saw that kind of worship, you know what I thought? These people, they know God. And I don't. And I don't. Yes. And guess what? I sat there and I listened to a message. And back in the day, Greg Laurie was a strong preacher of repentance. And for the first time in my life, I heard a clear message of repentance. And I realized all these years I thought I was a Christian. And I wasn't because somebody only gave me half of the gospel. When we tell people about Christ and the love of God, we have to make sure that we tell them about repentance and what it means. It means to change your mind. To stop being Stop living for yourself and live for God. Turn away from your sins because this was their problem. They did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual morality, and of their thefts. They continued to worship demons and idols, and, and those are the two spiritual sins. Those are sins directly against God. They worshiped false gods. They, they had other gods before gods. They broke the first of the commandments, but then they continued in their violation towards humanity. They violated the second part of the Ten Commandments, and they didn't care about the people that were around them. They continued in their murders. You think demons can kill of course they can. But guess who else can kill? You know, man under demonic influence is a murderer. Can be the vile, most murderous thing next to a demon. And we have people all over the world now that have no respect for human life. They'll kill them in the womb. They'll kill people without even thinking about it. They can take someone's life and it doesn't even bother them. Jesus said in the last days, the love of many will grow cold and men will hate one another and kill one another. It's not just the demons killing a third. It's the people who survive killing one another. They were already killing one another and they continue in their murders and their sorceries. The word sorcery is formakia. It's not so much witchcraft, it's drug abuse. They continued to do their drugs and they continued in the drug abuse, numbing, they were numbing themselves to reality. It's amazing at this time that drugs are still available, but obviously the devil is making the drugs available and they're still doing their drugs. And because of their drugs, it opens the door 
to demonic activity in their lives. You ever seen someone that's strung out on drugs for a long time? Most of them are paranoid schizophrenics, split personality disorder. That's what we call it. The Bible calls it demon possession. It's real. So the sorcery, the sexual morality, and the thefts. Sexual morality is a big one. And let me tell you something. The Bible is clear. Those who practice such things, sexual morality, idolatry, will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible is clear. So if you're living in sexual sin, if you know someone in your family that's living in sexual sin and you don't warn them, you don't tell them that they have to repent and come out of that lifestyle because you can't live in this condition and have intimacy with God. God says flee sexual immorality. Flee all forms of idolatry. Turn away from your murderous heart. Stop stealing and cheating and doing what's not right. As men of God, we are to always be seeking to do what's right because God's on the side of those who do what's right. And we need to be genuine towards people in the faith. As us being in the faith. And we need to love them with truth because the day, the month, the year, the hour, it's upon us. Let's pray. Father, we are so humbled at the truth of your scriptures that's being revealed to us here in the book of Revelation. And Lord, as men, we come before you confessing our sins. Lord, you have given us access to you by atonement through your blood. The veil in the temple is torn. And so, Lord, we come past the outer courts into the Holy of Holies and we confess our sins. Ask you to forgive us, cleanse us, go before us. Help us to be loyal and genuine in the faith. And that, Lord, we would put you above every other thing or person in this world. And that we would become holy vessels. God, I just pray for all my brothers here tonight that you would make each one of us more and more holy. Because without holiness, no one will see God. Purify us. Cleanse us. We thank you, Lord, that when we confess, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we open this study by saying we love you. And we close it by saying, Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name. Amen.